Welcome Sunday School teachers and Bible study leaders to our overview of LifeWays Explore the Bible lesson of Genesis 27, 18 through 30 with the title, A Deceiver, for Sunday, March 17th, 2024. One way that you could begin this lesson would be to ask your group, can you name some famous twins? <laughs> Maybe sadly, Mary Kate and Ashley Olson were the first to come to my mind. Of course, there's uh, Jenna and Barbara Bush, uh, George W. Bush's twin daughters. Uh, I read an article this week that said 17 magazines, as everybody knows, uh, famous twins such as Dylan and Cole Sprouse and Tia and Tamara Mowry. I literally never heard of these people, but they say that everybody knows them, so uh, maybe somebody. Of course, the constellation Gemini features twin stars, Castor and Pollux. A baseball fan might say the Minnesota Twins. All, all kinds of things you could get from uh, your group and just uh, opening, talking about twins, and then say, today we're going to look at a story of two of the most famous twins in, in the Bible, Jacob and Esau. And the, even that we call them Jacob and Esau, uh, with Jacob coming first, tells us a lot about this story, because as you know, traditionally it, it should have been the other way around, but it didn't turn out that way, as we shall see today. So looking at the context a little bit for, for this week's lesson, our study in Genesis jumps all the way from Abraham's servant looking for a wife for Isaac to now Isaac being on his deathbed seeking to bless Esau as his firstborn son. Uh, to me, the 13 verses of this uh, section are a little narrow, so I might plan on broadening the text just a little bit for this week because there's some good application just outside what, what they call the focal passage. But all told, there are some great uh, lessons in Genesis 27 in the surrounding verses uh, for this week. So we left off with Abraham's servant getting guidance, as we talked about last time, for finding a wife for Isaac in Genesis 24. The Bible goes on to say that after bitter angling, uh, he did uh, eventually bring her back to Isaac. Then I might begin this week with chapter 25, verses 19 and following, which talks about the records of the generations of Isaac. Verse 20 tells us Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, uh, the, the woman Abraham's servant found for him back east. Uh, then verse 21 says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered him and, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So verse 20 says, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife. If you look ahead, verse 26 says, Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to the twins. So just short of 40 years that uh, Isaac and Rebekah waited to have their children. So you can see why Isaac prayed to the Lord. For the longest time, it appeared they would not have a child. This was another test of faith. The promised line of blessing that God gave Abraham would be extinguished if Isaac didn't have an heir. Uh, so the whole promise was on the line. Uh, Abraham's offering of, of Isaac was not the last test this family would face. Now Isaac was being tested uh, too. But he did the right thing here. He took it to the Lord in prayer. And I see a real theme here, both Isaac and Rebekah seeking God. So I would make this uh, my point number one in, in the outline uh, this week. Uh, the, the line, and even though it's uh, somewhat in the context, you order it however you want to, but uh, point number one, seeking the Lord, chapter 25, uh, verses 21 and 22. So we see here, verse 21 says, Isaac sought the Lord in prayer for the pregnancy. And in verse 22, Rebecca sought God for understanding uh, what was going on inside of her. So both Isaac and Rebecca are good examples for us in seeking God <clears throat> at strategic times in our life. Now, uh, you and someone in your group may have a testimony specifically about uh, seeking God for a child and his answer to grant or, or not grant, uh, some, grant, grant a, a child. I shared with someone just this past week uh, how Cheryl and I, had uh, we'd had two sons right off after we started having children, then uh, we were hoping to have a daughter, but for several months we had not gotten pregnant, uh, which had happened immediately before. So I specifically sought the Lord in prayer that we might have another child, and specifically that if it was his will, that he would give us a girl. A few months later, we were expecting, and it turned out to be our daughter, Libby. I've told our kids she was the only child I specifically asked for, as so she gets a kick out of that. But uh, I did, and the Lord answered and, and did give us a daughter and a great one who is serving him today in Austin. But one, one thing you might emphasize, depending on the makeup of your class, is that God's will is different for each of us. I know a family where one twin had a very prayerful, almost miraculous uh, granting by God of children. The other twin did not. Uh, these kinds of things are in God's hands, and we need to trust him and his will in them. We should seek his will for us in our situation and accept it, whatever it is. Sometimes his answer is yes, sometimes it's no, or even wait. But uh, like, and it can be hard when it's, when it's no or, or wait. But like everything else, we need to trust God 
that he has a plan and purpose for every detail of our lives, whether we understand it or not. So I wouldn't use this story to guarantee that every time we ask God to give as a child, he will, but he did in this case. The second part of verse 21 says, and the Lord answered him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So Isaac sought the Lord about having a child. God did answer him. Then secondly, notice how Rebekah also sought the Lord in verse 22. It says, but the children, uh, there were more than one, there were twins, struggled together within her. And she said, if this is so, then why am I this way? And it says, so she went to inquire of the Lord. To me, this is a fantastic section. During her pregnancy, it was as if the two boys were fighting inside of her, of course, foreshadowing what, what their lives were going to be like. But Rebecca didn't understand this. She wanted to know, why am I this way? She had a question about her situation. What, what's happening here? Why am I struggling like this? Why am I this way? So what did she do? She brought it to the Lord. The last sentence of verse 22 says, she, so she went to inquire of the Lord. She did exactly what we should do when we're troubled by something or need wisdom or understanding. She went to the Lord and she inquired of him. Now, inquired of the Lord is a technical term in those days for seeking an answer from God. Sometimes they would inquire by asking the, the Urim and the Thummim. Uh, uh, theologians think it's something, or scholars think it's something akin to holy dice uh, from, from the priest. <clears throat> Later in Israel's history, they'd go to a prophet to inquire of the Lord or inquire in his temple, as Psalm 27 uh, talks about. But it means to seek an answer from God. So Rebecca is a great example to us today. When we're puzzled by our life, our situation, seek the Lord, inquire of the Lord, seek what he has to tell you about your situation. And to get your folks involved, you might ask them, can, can you, anybody share a time when you were puzzled by something in your life? And, and so you inquired of the Lord. Uh, for example, you can share this story if you'd like or share one of your own. But after I graduated from seminary, I had no church for a year, was waiting to, to be called somewhere. And I asked God, why? Lord, why? You've, you've called me here and you brought me all the way through seminary. And Why am I having to, to wait so long to even get a, a church to serve? And after spending time in, in prayer and in his word uh, for a number of days, God, days, God pointed me to the Beatitudes of Matthew 5, 3 through 12, which teaches the character of Christ that God is uh, building into each one of us uh, as his people. And now Romans 8, 28, 29 says, God's causing everything to work together to conform us to the image of his son. And God showed me that he purposefully kept me there to build the character of Christ more into my life. And I actually uh, started keeping a journal of all the ways I could see specific ways that he was building Christ's character into my life through the difficulties of that time. I learned lessons in that time I will never forget. But uh, like Rebecca, I had to inquire of the Lord. Why is this happening to me? Maybe you, maybe somebody in your group is, is going through a situation right now and you're, and you're questioning like Rebecca, why am I this way? What's happening? I, I don't understand this. If so, then inquire of the Lord. Take it to him. Don't just breathe a quick prayer about it. Spend some time searching his word and praying James 1 says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God and he will give it to you. Inquire of the Lord. So Rebecca inquired of the Lord and verse 23 says, he answered her. Uh, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. Now, this is an important word. Not only did God show Rebecca what was happening now, but also why. And it had a huge impact on the events that would unfold later in Genesis in the next chapter beyond and, of course, down to this day, in fact. So God told Rebecca the reason the two were fighting was that two nations would come from these two children. Of course, those nations would be the nation of Israel that would come from Jacob and the nation of Edom that would come from Esau. And God said, the older shall serve the younger, exactly the opposite of the cultural tradition in which the firstborn had the, the primacy. But so often, God does not do things the conventional way. Several times in his word, he goes out of his way to do things the opposite of the traditional or, or conventional way to show that he's sovereign, that his plan is different uh, than man's plans and traditions. And he does that with these children here. So verse 24 then uh, says there were indeed uh, twins born. Verse 25 says the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment. They named him Esau. Esau comes from a word that means rough, uh, rough to the handling, which makes sense that he was born all, all hairy like that. 
In verse 26 says, afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, means supplanter. My old Hebrew pro pro professor said that it literally means heel snatcher. He was snatching his heel uh, when, when, when he was born. And then it says Isaac was 60 years old when she, when she gave birth to them. That's where we see that it took them the 20 years to have children. And verse 27 says they were two very different kinds of men. It says Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. So in other words, for Esau, vacation would be camping. For Jacob, it was the Hampton Inn every time, right? So they're very different. And then in, in today's focus passage, then we're going to see how the switch happened from, from Esau uh, and uh, how his Jacob brother supplanted him or, or took his place. So chapter 27 then uh, uh, opens with Jacob calling his eldest son Esau, saying, I don't know the day of my death. So he tells him in verses 3 and 4, go hunt some game, make me a meal so that he may eat it and, and bless him before he dies. Of course, the blessing was a big deal in those days. We probably have a hard time in our culture understanding just how important it was, but it was a permanent passing on of favor and authority and inheritance to that son. It was a big deal. By tradition, it should have been Esau's, but as we will see, it is not. So kind of a lot of context there with some application, but I think it really helps us with this text this week. For my outline, what I'm going to do this week, and you can use it if you want to or do something different if you'd want, but... I'm looking at some big themes this week, uh, so th this outline is going to be a little different. My point number one will be seeking the Lord, uh, chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. And point two, falling short, uh, chapter 27, verses 18 through 30, as we see uh, how Jacob's going to fall short of maybe the, the, the life he should have lived. Then point three, God's plan fulfilled despite those shortcomings, uh, chapter 27, verses uh, 18 and 30, really, really the whole text. On both of those points. So let's get into it then going into point two, falling short uh, 27, 18 through 30. So in our, our focus passage, uh, verse 18 says, then he, Jacob, came to his father. This is after the, the, he had made the food in, in his brother's place and said, my father, he said, here am I, who are you, my son? Uh, who are you? Well, why did he ask that? There's the, the several hints in this passage that Isaac doubted that Jacob was really Esau. You can see some of these or ask your class if you want to. Can you see some of these? That he asks him in verse 8 here, who are, who are you? He is obviously doubting. Verse 20 says, how is it that you have it so quickly, my son? Didn't seem likely he got it so fast. Verse 21, he asks to feel him and see if he was really Esau. Verse 22, after feeling him, he still doubts. So the, the voice is the, is the voice of uh, Jacob. Uh, he, he, he says it, it doesn't seem like uh, it was really him. Uh, then, then in verse 24, he says, are you really my son Esau? So uh, Isaac doubted the whole time. Uh, but but what could he do? And that, the main point I would focus on here, though, is what do we see of Jacob's character here? We see he was a liar. He was a deceiver. Verse 19, he tells his dad, I'm Esau, your firstborn. He lied to his dad. Not only that, he's a blasphemer. Uh, look, when Isaac asks him how he got the game so quickly, he says, because the Lord your God caused it to happen to me. Man, don't bring God into it, friend. Uh, that, that's even worse. Now he's taking the Lord's name in vain. In fact, one thing you might do is read this passage or have your group read it and then ask them, how many of the Ten Commandments did Jacob break in this story? Uh, and it was a bunch. He bore false witness. He said it was Esau when he wasn't. He took God's name in vain, says the Lord caused it. He stole uh, from his brother. He coveted his brother's blessing before he stole it. He did not honor his father in this. He took advantage of him. So, you know, he, he didn't make a graven image or commit adultery, but he broke about everything else, right? Uh, so he, in all these ways, he fell short. He, he, he committed sins. He, he broke the Ten Commandments. But then I would apply it this way. Listen, let's don't just focus on Jacob. Yes, yes, he sinned. But the most important thing we need to be concerned about is not Jacob, but who? Ourselves. How many of God's commandments have I broken recently? And you might review the, those commandments and then talk about what they mean. Have you put anything ahead of God recently? Have you taken his name in vain or, or lightly? Have you not worshipped him on his day? Have you dishonored your father or mother in some way? Have you murdered somebody's character 
uh, by speaking badly of them or, or, or hating them in your heart. If you haven't committed adultery yet, have you looked at anything on, on the internet or personally that, that you shouldn't have? Have you taken something that wasn't yours or cheated on your taxes or expense account or cut corners in business? Have you lied, exaggerated, told the truth? Go through all those commandments and, and talk about, you know, we can criticize Jacob for his sins, but how many have we broken? And of course, the answer is we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and this is why we need a Savior. So here's a great place to share the gospel in Sunday's lesson. I'd make it a goal to try to share the gospel at some place in the lesson every Sunday, and this would be a great place to do it. Yes, he sinned, but we've all sinned. This is why we need a Savior. This is a great reminder. Uh, Jacob was not the patriarch and the namesake of Israel because of his good works. Uh, he became what he did by God's grace. Now, this does not excuse his actions, and uh, it's not to serve an excuse for our actions either. But the truth is, we have all sinned just like he did. The only way any of us will be in God's kingdom is just by his grace. Every, vir virtually every page in the Bible reminds us of God's grace, and, and the, the story of Jacob certainly does that. His, his story is a testament of grace, so let's remember our story is a testament of, of grace too. We all stand only by the grace of God. So thank him for it, and then be ready to show his grace to others that he has shown to you. Then finally, I would look at, at this because I, I just think this is an amazing part of this story. And that's, that's point number three, God's plan fulfilled. Uh, verse 29, of course, uh, of the blessing was a key where he tells him when he blesses him, be master of your brothers. May your mother's sons bow down to you. Isaac did give J uh, Jacob the primacy over his brother. He stole that blessing by deceiving his father. How do we apply this to, to our lives today? We don't just want to teach a history lesson. How, how do we apply this? Well, what Rebecca and Jacob did was a sin. She, she deceived her husband. He deceived his father. They defrauded Esau, the blessing that was rightly his. What they did was wrong. It is not a model of family behavior. So one thing I might uh, point out to distinguish in the Bible between the prescriptive and the descriptive in the Bible. Not everything in the Bible is prescriptive. In other words, prescribed, something that we should do. Sometimes it's just descriptive. It doesn't. It just describes what they did. It doesn't necessarily prescribe that that is what we should do. It doesn't mean it was good or, or a model for us. And there are a lot of passages in the Bible that way. Just because somebody in the Bible did something doesn't mean that we should do it. It may not be prescriptive. It may just be descriptive. There is a big difference. Now, uh, of course, we're always very good at justifying our sins. My wife, Cheryl, says we have the gift of justification. Uh, what justification uh, might Rebecca have had? Well, God told her the older was going to so serve the younger. So in, in her uh, eyes, this might have just been a way to accomplish that. What could Jacob's justification have been? Well, mom wanted me to do this. But did what, what they did, was it right? No, it was still wrong uh, what they did. But despite that, and here's to me the big point. God can use even our sins, even our mistakes, even our poor choices in the unfolding of his will. What Rebecca did in deceiving her husband was a sin. What Jacob did was a sin. And yet somehow all of this fit into God's plan that the older shall serve the younger, just like he foretold in 2523. So in a sense, God used even their sins and their failures in carrying out his ultimate plan. Of course, we see other examples of this in, in his word. I think of David and Bathsheba. Is what David did with Bathsheba a sin? Absolutely it was. And he was called out big time by Nathan the prophet for his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder he uh, covered it up with. But when you read the genealogy of Jesus in the New Testament, who's there? Bathsheba and her son Solomon through, through David. In fact, Matthew uses the words in, in Matthew 1.6, Quote, to David was born Solomon through her who had been the wife of Uriah. Doesn't hide it. Uh, she was another man's wife. David took her. It, it was wrong. Yet, somehow in God's plan, the child born of this unholy union would be in the line of the Messiah, Jesus. <clears throat> so it might be amazing to us that God could use even some of the worst things in our lives in the carrying out of his ultimate plans. Does that mean that what we did was right? No, it was a sin. But can God use it still somehow in his sovereignty to fulfill his ultimate plan? Yes, we, we may scratch our heads, but God's wisdom is so far beyond ours. 
It's like when the, the devil thought he had God in a checkmate. I've killed the Messiah. I've won. But God goes, no, I just raised him from the dead. And all of a sudden, all the, all the sins of the world have just been paid because you killed him. Checkmate. You see, it was somehow all in God's plan. This is like Acts 2.23, it says, uh, according to the predetermined will and foreknowledge of God, you nailed him to a cross. Was it wrong for them uh, to nail the innocent son of God to a cross? Absolutely, it was. Uh, but did God use it to accomplish his plan? Yes, he did. So if you look at the crucifixion story of Jesus, you see all kinds of people who sinned along the, the way. Judas and Peter and Pilate and the Jews, and many others. But God used it all, even the bad in the unfolding of his plan. So we can be comforted today that God can do the same things in our lives today. Did we sin? Yes. Did we fail? Yes. But can God still use it? Yes. And can he still use us? Maybe the more, the more important question. And the answer is yes. And sometimes he even uses some of the worst aspects of our sin for his kingdom purposes. I think a great illustration of this point of how God can use anything, and I think he intended it that way, actually, is from uh, Lord of the Rings author J.R.R. Tolkien in his book, The Silmarillion, which tells how Eru, E-R-U, called the, the, the one, the father of all, who teaches Einar, A-I-N-U-R, the, the eternal spirit, uh, the eternal spirits, like the angels, he, the, he teaches them his, his divine music. But there's one of these angels, Melkor, who introduces his own song, which brought discord into the music to try to ruin it. But every time Melkor tried to ruin it with something discordant, Eru would somehow incorporate even those discordant sounds into a newer, more beautiful melody than had been before. And Eru finally says to Melkor, after he tried this two or three times, he said, And thou, Melkor, shall see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me, nor can any alter the music in my despite. For he that attempteth this shall but prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself hath not imagined. Even the discord that Melkor tried to bring into the music, Eru turned into a better melody. And of course, Tolkien certainly meant this as a picture of what God does. He causes all things to work together, even our sin, even our worst things. He causes them all to work together for good. Now, in case Tolkien is too lofty for some of your class members, maybe they'd appreciate a country song instead to make a similar point. How about God bless the broken, lo or broken road that led me here to you? All the hurts and pains of the broken road, God used to, to bring him to the right one in, in that song. I don't know how Christian the, the writers of that song are, but, but God certainly does things like that. Somehow in his exceeding wise plan, he can incorporate even some of the worst mistakes we make into his plan and use them for good. No wonder Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. It just ought to cause us to fall down before God and worship him. And that's what he does with Jacob and Rebekah here. Should they have deceived Isaac? No, but did it fit into his eternal plan? Yes, it did. As we know, Jacob's name was later changed to Israel and the name of Israel and the Messiah, uh, the, the nation of Israel and the Messiah, Jesus our Savior, came from his line of genealogy. God blessed that broken road and he used it in his purposes. Is that an excuse to sin? No, uh, don't take it that way. But can it comfort us uh, as God's people when we make our mistakes that God can still use it? Absolutely. And uh, another application, of course, is able, God is able to use flawed people in his plan. God can use us. How many of us are flawed? How, how many of us have failed? Of course, it's all. Uh, and, you know, it's likely, uh, teacher, that a number of people in your class may wonder, can God use me because of some failure in my past or some flaw they have in their present? But this story in Genesis reminds us God can and will still use us whatever our past sins or present flaws if we will present ourselves to him to be used. If you have time, you might ask your group, share a list of flawed people God used in the Bible. Of course, so many, Abraham, Moses, David, the list goes on and on. And yet God used them. And then make the point, God can and will use you too if you will make yourself available to him. I might even have with you that Sunday a sign-up sheet for some ministries or mission partnerships or places of service. Show them something specific they can do to apply this lesson and let God use them. 
Jacob did not get away with anything here in Genesis 27. There's a lot of hurt, a lot of fallout from it, as we will see. He had to work through a lot of things, as we'll see in the succeeding lessons, to try to heal and reconcile because of what he did. But God did use him uh, as the heir through whom the tribes of Israel would be born and through whom the Messiah would come. And, and thankfully, God can do the same thing in us. and He can use us even through our failures today as well. I hope that'll help you some as you get ready for this week. Remember, if you'd like to read or print out a text version of this overview to print out the Tolkien story or one of the other quotes or, or anything else, you can get that on my blog at www.seanethomas.com. I'll post that address in the sections, uh, the comment section below. If you'll hit subscribe to this video, YouTube will automatically send you next week's and you won't have to search for it. And if you write anything in the comments below, I'll be sure to pray for you for your group, any specific prayer request you mention by name this week. For my licensing agreement with LifeWay, these weekly lessons are based on content from Explore the Bible Adult Resources. The presentation is my own. It has not been reviewed by LifeWay. LifeWay resources are available at goexplorethebible.com, goexplorethebible.com slash adults dash training. And if you have questions about Explore the Bible resources, you can send emails to explorethebible at lifeway.com.